Chapter 12 of 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Edwin Epps, of whom much will be said during the remainder of this history, is a large, portly, heavy-bodied man with light hair, high cheekbones, and a Roman nose of extraordinary dimensions. He has blue eyes, a fair complexion, and is, as I should say, full six feet high. He has the sharp, inquisitive expression of a jockey. His manners are repulsive and coarse, and his language gives speedy and unequivocal evidence that he has never enjoyed the advantages of an education. He has the faculty of saying most provoking things, in that respect even excelling old Peter Tanner. At the time I came into his possession, Edwin Epps was fond of the bottle, his sprees, sometimes extending over the space of two whole weeks. Latterly, however, he had reformed his habits, and when I left him, was as strict a specimen of temperance as could be found on Bayou Berth. When, in his cups, Master Epps was a roistering, blustering, noisy fellow, whose chief delight was in dancing with his niggers, or lashing them about the yard with his long whip, just for the pleasure of hearing them screech and scream, as the great welts were planted on their backs. When sober, he was silent, reserved, and cunning, not beating us indiscriminately, as in his drunken moments, but sending the end of his rawhide to some tender spot of a lagging slave, with a sly dexterity peculiar to himself. He had been a driver and overseer in his younger years, but at this time was in possession of a plantation on Bayou Huff Power, two and a half miles from Holmesville, eighteen from Marksville, and twelve from Cheneyville. It belonged to Joseph B. Roberts, his wife's uncle, and was leased by Epps. His principal business was raising cotton, and, inasmuch as some may read this book who have never seen a cotton field, a description of the manner of its culture may not be out of place. The ground is prepared by throwing up beds or ridges with the plough, back furrowing it is called, Oxen and mules, the latter almost exclusively, are used in ploughing. The women as frequently as the men perform this labour, feeding, currying and taking care of their teams, and in all respects doing the field and stable work precisely as do the ploughboys of the north. The beds, or ridges, are six feet wide, that is from water furrow to water furrow. A plough drawn by one mule is then run along the top of the ridge or centre of the bed, making the drill, into which a girl usually drops the seed, which she carries in a bag hung round her neck. Behind her comes a mule and harrow, covering up the seed, so that two mules, three slaves, a plough and harrow are employed in planting a row of cotton. This is done in the months of March and April. Corn is planted in February. When there are no cold rains, the cotton usually makes its appearance in a week. In the course of eight or ten days afterwards, the first hoeing is commenced. This is performed in part, also, by the aid of the plough and mule. The plough passes as near as possible to the cotton on both sides, throwing the furrow from it. Slaves follow with their hoes, cutting up the grass and cotton, leaving hills two feet and a half apart. This is called scraping cotton. In two weeks more commences the second hoeing. This time the furrow is thrown towards the cotton. Only one stalk, the largest, is now left standing in each hill. In another fortnight it is hoed the third time, throwing the furrow towards the cotton in the same manner as before, and killing all the grass between the rows. About the 1st of July, when it is a foot high or thereabouts, it is hoed the fourth and last time. Now the whole space between the rows is ploughed, leaving a deep water furrow in the centre. During all these hoeings, the overseer or driver follows the slaves on horseback with a whip, such as has been described. The fastest hoer takes the lead row. He is usually about a rod in advance of his companions. If one of them passes him, he is whipped. If one falls behind or is a moment idle, he is whipped. In fact, the lash is flying from morning until night the whole day long. The hoeing season thus continues from April until July, a field having no sooner been finished once than it is commenced again. In the latter part of August begins the cotton picking season. 
At this time, each slave is presented with a sack. A strap is fastened to it, which goes over the neck, holding the mouth of the sack breast high, while the bottom reaches nearly to the ground. Each one is also presented with a large basket that will hold about two barrels. This is to put the cotton in when the sack is filled. The baskets are carried to the field and placed at the beginning of the rows. When a new hand, one unaccustomed to the business, is sent for the first time into the field, he is whipped up smartly and made for that day to pick as fast as he can possibly. At night, it is weighed, so that his capability in cotton picking is known. He must bring in the same weight each night following. If it falls short, it is considered evidence that he has been laggard, and a greater or less number of lashes is the penalty. An ordinary day's work is £200. A slave who is accustomed to picking is punished if he or she brings in a less quantity than that. There is a great difference among them as regards this kind of labour. Some of them seem to have a natural knack or quickness which enables them to pick with great celerity and with both hands, while others, with whatever practice or industry, are utterly unable to come up to the ordinary standard. Such hands are taken from the cotton field and employed in other business. Patsy, of whom I shall have more to say, was known as the most remarkable cotton picker on Bayou Berth. She picked with both hands and with such surprising rapidity that £500 a day was not unusual for her. Each one is tasked, therefore, according to his picking abilities, none, however, to come short of 200 weight. I, being unskillful always in that business, would have satisfied my master by bringing in the latter quantity, while, on the other hand, Patsy would surely have been beaten if she failed to produce twice as much. The cotton grows from five to seven feet high, each stalk having a great many branches, shooting out in all directions and lapping each other above the water furrow. There are few sights more pleasant to the eye than a wide cotton field when it is in the bloom. It presents an appearance of purity, like an immaculate expanse of light, new-fallen snow. Sometimes the slave picks down one side of a row and back upon the other, but more usually there is one on either side, gathering all that has blossomed, leaving the unopened bowls for a succeeding picking. When the sack is filled, it is emptied into the basket and trodden down. It is necessary to be extremely careful the first time going through the field in order not to break the branches off the stalks. The cotton will not bloom upon a broken branch. Epps never failed to inflict the severest chastisement on the unlucky servant who, either carelessly or unavoidably, was guilty in the least degree in this respect. The hands are required to be in the cotton field as soon as it is light in the morning, and with the exception of 10 or 15 minutes, which is given them at noon to swallow their allowance of cold bacon, they are not permitted to be a moment idle until it is too dark to see, and when the moon is full, they oftentimes labour till the middle of the night. They do not dare to stop even at dinner time, nor return to the quarters, however late it be, until the order to halt is given by the driver. The day's work over in the field, the baskets are toted, or, in other words, carried to the gin house, where the cotton is weighed. No matter how fatigued and weary he may be, no matter how much he longs for sleep and rest, a slave never approaches the gin house with his basket of cotton but with fear. If it falls short in weight, if he has not performed the full task appointed him, he knows that he must suffer. And if he has exceeded it by 10 or 20 pounds, in all probability his master will measure the next day's task accordingly. So, whether he has too little or too much, his approach to the gin house is always with fear and trembling. Most frequently they have too little, and therefore it is they are not anxious to leave the field. After weighing, follow the whippings, and then the baskets are carried to the cotton house and their contents stored away like hay, all hands being sent in to tramp it down. If the cotton is not dry, instead of taking it to the gin house at once, it is laid upon platforms, two feet high and some three times as wide, covered with boards or plank, with narrow walks running between them. This done, the labour of the day is not yet ended by any means. 
Each one must then attend to his respective chores. One feeds the mules, another the swine, another cuts the wood, and so forth. Besides, the packing is all done by candlelight. Finally, at a late hour, they reach the quarters, sleepy and overcome with a long day's toil. Then a fire must be kindled in the cabin, the corn ground in the small hand mill, and supper and dinner for the next day in the field prepared. All that is allowed them is corn and bacon, which is given out at the corn crib and smokehouse every Sunday morning. Each one receives, as his weekly allowance, three and a half pounds of bacon and corn enough to make a peck of meal. That is all. No tea, coffee, sugar, and, with the exception of a very scanty sprinkling now and then, no salt. I can say, from a ten years' residence with Master Epps, that no slave of his is ever likely to suffer from the gout, superinduced by excessive high living. Master Epps' hogs were fed on shelled corn. It was thrown out to his niggers in the ear. The former, he thought, would fatten faster by shelling and soaking it in the water. The latter, perhaps, if treated in the same manner, might grow too fat to labour. Master Epps was a shrewd calculator and knew how to manage his own animals, drunk or sober. The corn mill stands in the yard beneath a shelter. It is like a common coffee mill, the hopper holding about six quarts. There was one privilege which Master Epps granted freely to every slave he had. They might grind their corn nightly, in such small quantities as their daily wants required, or they might grind the whole week's allowance at one time, on Sundays, just as they preferred. A very generous man was Master Epps. I kept my corn in a small wooden box, the meal in a gourd. And, by the way, the gourd is one of the most convenient and necessary utensils on a plantation. Besides supplying the place of all kinds of crockery in a slave cabin, it is used for carrying water to the fields. Another, also, contains the dinner. It dispenses with the necessity of pails, dippers, basins, and such tin and wooden superfluities altogether. When the corn is ground and fire is made, the bacon is taken down from the nail on which it hangs, a slice cut off and thrown upon the coals to broil. The majority of slaves have no knife, much less a fork. They cut their bacon with the axe at the woodpile. The corn meal is mixed with a little water, placed in the fire and baked. When it is done brown, the ashes are scraped off and being placed upon a chip, which answers for a table, the tenant of the slave hut is ready to sit down upon the ground to supper. By this time, it is usually midnight. The same fear of punishment with which they approach the gin house possesses them again on lying down to get a snatch of rest. It is the fear of oversleeping in the morning. Such an offence would certainly be attended with not less than twenty lashes. With a prayer that he may be on his feet and wide awake at the first sound of the horn, he sinks to his slumbers nightly. The softest couches in the world are not to be found in the log mansion of the slave. The one whereon I reclined year after year was a plank twelve inches wide and ten feet long. My pillow was a stick of wood. The bedding was a coarse blanket, and not a rag or shred beside. Moss might be used, were it not that it directly breeds a swarm of fleas. The cabin is constructed of logs, without floor or window. The latter is altogether unnecessary, the crevices between the logs admitting sufficient light. In stormy weather, the rain drives through them, rendering it comfortless and extremely disagreeable. The rude door hangs on great wooden hinges. In one end is constructed an awkward fireplace. An hour before daylight, the horn is blown. Then the slaves arouse, prepare their breakfast, fill a gourd with water, in another deposit their dinner of cold bacon and corn cake, and hurry to the field again. It is an offence invariably followed by a flogging to be found at the quarters after daybreak. Then the fears and labours of another day begin, and until its close there is no such thing as rest. He fears he will be caught lagging through the day. He fears to approach the gin house with his basket load of cotton at night. 
He fears when he lies down that he will oversleep himself in the morning. Such is a true, faithful, unexaggerated picture and description of the slave's daily life during the time of cotton picking on the shores of Bayou Boeuf. In the month of January, generally, the fourth and last picking is completed. Then commences the harvesting of corn. This is considered a secondary crop and receives far less attention than the cotton. It is planted, as already mentioned, in February. Corn is grown in that region for the purpose of fattening hogs and feeding slaves. Very little, if any, being sent to market. It is the white variety, the ear of great size and the stalk growing to the height of eight and oftentimes ten feet. In August the leaves are stripped off, dried in the sun, bound in small bundles and stored away as provender for the mules and oxen. After this the slaves go through the field, turning down the ear for the purpose of keeping the rains from penetrating to the grain. It is left in this condition until after cotton picking is over, whether earlier or later. Then the ears are separated from the stalks and deposited in the corn crib with the husks on. Otherwise, stripped of the husks, the weevil would destroy it. The stalks are left standing in the field. The Carolina, or sweet, potato is also grown in that region to some extent. They are not fed, however, to hogs or cattle and are considered but of small importance. They are preserved by placing them upon the surface of the ground with a slight covering of earth or corn stalks. There is not a cellar on Bayou Berth. The ground is so low it would fill with water. Potatoes are worth from two to three bits or shillings a barrel. Corn, except where there is an unusual scarcity, can be purchased at the same rate. As soon as the cotton and corn crops are secured, the stalks are pulled up, thrown into piles and burned. The ploughs are started at the same time, throwing up the beds again, preparatory to another planting. The soil, in the parishes of Rapides and Avoyel, and throughout the whole country, as far as my observation extended, is of exceeding richness and fertility. It is a kind of marl, of a brown or reddish colour. It does not require those invigorating composts necessary to more barren lands, and on the same field the same crop is grown for many successive years. Ploughing, planting, picking cotton, gathering the corn, and pulling and burning stalks occupies the whole of the four seasons of the year. Drawing and cutting wood, pressing cotton, fattening and killing hogs are but incidental labours. In the month of September or October, the hogs are run out of the swamps by dogs and confined in pens. On a cold morning, generally about New Year's Day, they are slaughtered. Each carcass is cut into six parts and piled one above the other in salt upon large tables in the smokehouse. In this condition it remains a fortnight when it is hung up and a fire built and continued more than half the time during the remainder of the year. This thorough smoking is necessary to prevent the bacon from becoming infested with worms. In so warm a climate, it is difficult to preserve it, and very many times myself and my companions have received our weekly allowance of three pounds and a half when it was full of these disgusting vermin. Although the swamps are overrun with cattle, they are never made the source of profit to any considerable extent. The planter cuts his mark upon the ear, or brands his initials upon the side, and turns them into the swamps, to roam unrestricted within their almost limitless confines. They are the Spanish breed, small and spike-horned. I have known of droves being taken from Bayou Berth, but it is a very rare occurrence. The value of the best cows is about $5 each. Two quarts at one milking would be considered an unusual large quantity. They furnish little tallow, and that of a soft inferior quality. Notwithstanding the great number of cows that throng the swamps, the planters are indebted to the north for their cheese and butter, which is purchased in the New Orleans market. Salted beef is not an article of food, either in the great house or in the cabin. Master Epps was accustomed to attend shooting matches for the purpose of obtaining what fresh beef he required. These sports occurred weekly at the neighbouring village of Holmesville. Fat beeves were driven thither and shot at, a stipulated price being demanded for the privilege. 
the lucky marksman divides the flesh among his fellows, and in this manner the attending planters are supplied. The great number of tame and untamed cattle which swarm the woods and swamps of Bayou Boeuf most probably suggested that appellation to the French, inasmuch as the term, translated, signifies the creek or river of the wild ox. Garden products, such as cabbages, turnips and the like, are cultivated for the use of the master and his family. They have greens and vegetables at all times and seasons of the year. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth before the desolating winds of autumn in the chill northern latitudes, but perpetual verdure overspreads the hot lowlands, and flowers bloom in the heart of winter in the region of Bayou Boeuf. There are no meadows appropriated to the cultivation of the grasses. The leaves of the corn supply a sufficiency of food for the labouring cattle, while the rest provide for themselves all the year in the ever-growing pasture. There are many other peculiarities of climate, habit, custom, and of the manner of living and labouring at the south, but the foregoing, it is supposed, will give the reader an insight and general idea of life on a cotton plantation in Louisiana. The mode of cultivating cane and the process of sugar manufacturing will be mentioned in another place. End of chapter 12